Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm not sure how I can respond to that very easily, but let me first of all thank the forum for the invitation. And because I work every day in a place in the, the United Kingdom, at one time used a lot by Winston Churchill, and because I think you all need to relax uh, a little bit after all these speeches, I just thought I'd start by telling you a short Churchill story about an invitation which has nothing to do with child rights, by the way. And this is about the world-famous playwright George Bernard Shaw uh, in the 1930s who once sent Winston Churchill a note as follows. Uh, Dear Winston, I'm sending you two tickets for my new play opening tomorrow night. Please come and bring a friend if you have one. <clears throat> Winston Churchill sent a note back saying, Dear GBS, sadly, I cannot come tomorrow, but I will gladly attend your second night if you have one. Uh, back to the slightly more serious business. I'm obviously delighted to be here on behalf of the International Rescue Committee, which is an international humanitarian NGO headquartered in New York with strong European links, including here in Sweden. And it was established in 1933 at the request of Albert, Alfred Einstein, among others, originally to help resettle Jewish refugees fleeing Europe, which gives us a strong link, I think, with Count Volker Bernadotte, uh, who did so much to save lives at that time as well. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I was asked, uh, I'm listed in the, the program as an inspirational speaker, and I'm not sure I can do that, not uh, particularly so having heard such inspirational words from the, uh, the person on the platform before me. And we've also reached that point in the day when just about everything uh, has already been said, although not yet necessarily by everyone. But perhaps I can at least uh, wake you up and shake you up a bit, because my focus will be on children emergencies, and you've heard a bit about that already. But what does that really mean? a child in an emergency, because in comfortable, warm rooms in comfortable countries like Sweden, it is actually very hard to imagine what this really signifies, even when you hear powerful speeches about it, as we have done today. And the closest most of us will come to this, I think, is the sudden death of an immediate member of our family, a parent, a child, a brother, or a sister. Imagine the personal devastation that that brings and then multiply it by 10. You're a child for whom everything familiar and normal has gone, from one moment to another, perhaps. Your parents are dead or have disappeared. Your home has been destroyed. Your friends have been scattered. You have no idea where the next meal is coming from, never mind the next lesson at school, if, if it still exists. And the future, your future all of a sudden, which seemed reasonably clear, perhaps in many ways, it's gone. And it's at best unpredictable now, but certainly unimaginable. And because we sometimes think this sort of occurrence to people is normal in some countries, in some societies, let me just remind you that for this child, he wasn't expecting it any more than you will be expecting it tomorrow if your t world has suddenly turned upside down in that way. And that's the mental leap you have to make to try and understand what we're actually talking about. Now, I saw all this for myself when I was the United Nations Emergency Relief Coordinator until 2010. And in the camps of Darfur, the killing fields of Sri Lanka, the shattered communities of South Sudan, the wrecked buildings of Gaza, and so many other tragic places, I saw lost and terrified and bewildered children. It was heartbreaking, but when these children suddenly had some space to be safe, some space to learn, and some space to play. That was a special source of satisfaction and of hope. The problem we face is that this kind of suffering is growing much faster than the resources we have available to deal with it. You've heard a lot today about the 60 million people displaced in the world. Half of them are children. And as you just heard, the average length of, of displacement is 17 years, and that means for many child, children, that's the whole of their childhood. Just try to imagine that. <clears throat> so what does the International Rescue Committee do? We have programs worth 
$700 million annually, working with many partners, including many in this room, to help more than 17 million people who are affected by conflict and disaster in 40 countries, Syria, South Sudan, the Central African Republic, and many others. And now we are, shockingly, back in Europe too. In June, we started operations on the Greek island of Lesbos to help the hundreds of thousands of refugees making desperately dangerous journeys to reach safety in Europe. 3,000 people are still arriving every day on Lesbos, despite the winter. And they include some 50 unaccompanied children every week. Let's try to imagine that, thinking of our own children in their place. Now, in all the places where we work, the International Rescue Committee has a special focus on children. We provide family tracing services. We provide parent parenting support, emergency education, safe spaces, protection from abuse and neglect, psychosocial support, just as important as practical goods, and training to help empower children to heal from their trauma and take control of their own lives. We have a special focus on protecting children from sexual violence, and we believe that donors must do more to fund education and child protection programs in emergency settings from the start. So that's the context. But my specific exam question, and we've heard a lot about this today, is how the private sector and the humanitarian community can actually work together better in this crucial area. When I worked at the United Nations, I was frustrated by many things, actually, but frustrated by this too, how limited, how limited the cooperation was between the humanitarian organizations and the private sector. The truth is that the humanitarian organizations were so busy firefighting the latest crisis that they had little resource to engage with the private sector and little idea how to find the right companies to work with. The private companies had huge difficulty working out how to engage with the humanitarians, faced as they were and as they are, with a bewildering number of agencies and organizations with overlapping mandates. So we have to do much better if we're going to bridge the yawning gap there is between needs and resources, and to make use of the capacity and goodwill from companies who have the technology and the skills and the creativity which they can bring to a humanitarian s sector which is sadly starved of all three. Because the truth is that pooling our efforts, we can have a much better chance of improving the lives of children who are affected by crisis. And this can also fulfill the aspirations of so many people who work in the private sector, not just to help their companies make money, but also to work, make the world a better place. In any case, as others have already said, the private sector can no longer imagine it lives in a protected space where global problems are someone else's problem. People used to say, these questions in the Middle East and North Africa, they'll wash up on our shores one day. Well, now they have, and how. So let's get practical. We can't easily fix global governance or bring world peace, but we can create more practical, specific, individual partnerships between humanitarian and civil society organizations on the one hand and private sector companies and foundations on the other. And we can make these partnerships larger scale, more sustained and sustainable, and more proactive than they are now. And one obvious area for this partnership, and again, we've heard a lot about this today, is education. Approximately half of all children in the world who are out of school live in countries affected by conflict. So education in emergencies is critical to protect children from violence and exploitation, to provide stability, uh, stability to help them recover from their trauma, and to develop their academic and their social and their emotional skills. But only 2% of humanitarian aid currently goes to education. That should be improved. But meanwhile, the private sector can work with governments and with humanitarian organizations to ensure access for all children to safe, high-quality education. Where there are no formal schools, they can provide or help provide alternatives like community-based spaces or distance learning. Education for older children can be combined with realistic training in livelihood skills. Teachers can be given the, internet, the information technology and other tools they need to do the job effectively. And this is not just theory. Let me just give you a couple of examples of current partnerships employed by the International Rescue Committee. We work, for example, with MasterCard to offer cards and cash to enable those in need to make choices which suit their individual needs 
and that's particularly helpful in urban settings. The Bezos Foundation has supported uh, an IRC initiative called Healing Classrooms to help Syrian refugee children in Iraq and Lebanon to cope with trauma and resume learning safely. The IRC and the Nike Foundation have worked together to provide economic opportunities for adolescent girls in Nairobi, both Kenyans and refugees. Girls are trained in business and life skills before, we, before being paired up with franchise partner, partners. Ericsson and the IRC have put together their skills to connect to the internet, a Syrian refugee camp in Iraq. And we hope other corporate organizations we're talking to, like Lego and the IKEA Foundation, will also become similarly involved. And let me make one final broader point. I am finishing, don't worry. I can see you lurking and glaring at me. <coughs> let me just make one final broader point. The humanitarian world is moving in directions where private sector involvement makes more sense than ever. First of all, most displaced people are now in urban settings, in cities and towns. They're not in rural camps. And that means they're closer to normal economic life and closer to the possibility of private sector help, private sector li livelihoods, and private sector training. Secondly, humanitarians now accept that our role after a crisis is not mainly to provide aid in the form of goods, but to help to find ways of encouraging local people to build back normal economic infrastructure as fast as possible. For example, by helping local businesses restock and rebuild. And third, we're much more focused, and we should be even more focused than we are now, on anticipating catastrophic events, natural disasters, and reducing their impact, not just responding afterwards. And that means building local capacity, and that means creating local partnerships in, in disaster-prone areas between public authorities, civil society organizations, and not least, local companies. Now, we need these new opportunities for the private sector to offer expertise and partnership with humanitarian organizations. Because we do live in a world, and we've heard this already today, where both conflicts and natural disasters are going to go on growing, and where children will continue to pay the biggest price. So we look forward to sharing knowledge, expertise, and commitment with all of you to make a difference to those millions of children whose lives have been shattered. Now, I started with Winston Churchill, so let me finish with him too. He once said, if you happen to find yourself going through hell, the only thing to do is keep going. So ladies and gentlemen, let's keep going.